All right. Good morning, everyone. I think this is uh, <clears throat> our, our, our last class for the, for, for the term, uh, our last presentation here on the, uh, the mathematical analysis of free fall and, and projectile motion. Um, let's start by where all this comes from. And it comes from this work here by Galileo. This course is on two new sciences, published in 1638. By the way, it's very cool to look at the Roman numerals. You can see this is, this is indeed 1638. If, <laughs> if you remember your Roman numerals, M is 1,000, D is 500, C is 100, and the X is a, so it's very cool. That is, that is in fact 1638. And uh, this is considered a, a, his, his greatest work in terms of physics. Of course, he's very well known as an astronomer getting in such trouble with the church uh, on, uh, on his views of the, uh, of the earth going around the sun. But, on, but without a doubt, this is his most important contribution um, to physics, uh, opening up the law of um, the science of motion. And that's what the, uh, what's being said over here is that uh, many scientists, many historians of science and math feel that this is perhaps the most important book on mathematics um, since, since the ancient Greeks, because it tackles a really a new subject in that it tackles the, uh, the mathematics of motion. Um, the, the Greeks and, and the legacy of the Greeks <clears throat> with, with the further mathematicians leading up to the Renaissance uh, stayed within the U U U Euclidean algorithm, which is basically a static kind of, uh, uh, of mathematics. Um, it does not deal really with, with, with moving objects. Even the great Archimedes did not really attempt much uh, in, in that area. So this is considered uh, very much a seminal work, not only in physics, but also in mathematics. And I'd like to uh, uh, read to you uh, a wonderful, the opening uh, uh, paragraphs of his third day. The first two days is called Discourse on Two New Sciences. The first science is in the science of, 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 of uh, three-dimensional bodies and their strengths and, and, and things like that. But the, the last two days is on motion. And he says, my purpose is to set forth a very new science dealing with a very ancient subject. There is in nature perhaps nothing older than motion, concerning which books written by philosophers are neither few nor small. Nevertheless, I have discovered by experiment some properties of it which are worth knowing and which have not been hitherto been either observed or demonstrated. Oh, some, some superficial observations have been made as for instance, that natural motion of a heavy falling body is continuously accelerated. But to just what extent this acceleration occurs has not been announced. For so far as I know, no one has pointed out that the distances traversed during equal intervals of time by a body falling from rest stand to one another in the same ratio as the odd numbers, beginning with unity. I hope you guys had a chance to watch one of the two videos uh, that I suggested about the free fall experiments. If you haven't, please go back if you get a chance and, and do that. And the, uh, both videos talk uh, about the, uh, the famous odd numbers rule of Galileo, <clears throat> which we will come in our presentation shortly. It has been observed that missiles and projectiles describe a curved path of some sort. However, no one has pointed out the fact that this path is a parabola. But this and other facts, not few in number or, or less well worth knowing, I have succeeded in proving. And what I consider more important, and this is a, pretty much the theme of what I would like to show today to wrap up our entire course, what I consider more important, there have been opened up to this vast and most excellent science of which my work is merely the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Ways and means by which other minds more acute than mine. Yeah, you believe that about Galileo. I got a bridge to sell you. By which other minds more, more acute than mine will explore its remote corners. This is part of Galileo's genius that he realizes that what he has is just a start. And in fact, this is a new way and means of doing physics, of studying nature, uh, using mathematics in this way, fundamentally different than the way the Greeks um, and, and their successors used it. Very much aware of what he has, what he's putting forth here. 
Last paragraph, this will set the, uh, the tone for our, our class. This discussion is divided into three parts. The first deals with the motion which is steady or uniform. The second treats the motion which we find it an accelerated in nature. And the third deals with the so-called violent motions and with projectiles. And that's exactly the, the, the uh, format that I'm going to follow, guys. We're going to go through those three uh, formats. We're going to start with steady and uniform motion and see his discovery of the law of inertia. Uh, second, we'll move into accelerated motion of nature. We'll see his discovery of the law of freefall. And finally, we will study his analysis of the motion of a projectile. <clears throat> so let us begin. Begin with 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 the with the, uh, with the law uh, of inertia. Um, this is basically the idea. What you're looking at. This is his great thought experiment that when you roll a ball down an inclined plane, if you could take away all the friction and have a perfect ball in a perfect situation, the ball would roll up another plane, reaching the very same height. And if you were to go ahead and successfully change that height of that second uh, plane, the ball would have to roll further and further to enable to attain that same initial height that the ball was rolled at in the first place. And he asked the question, well, then what would happen if you put the plane all the way down flat? When would the ball stop rolling? We know when the ball stops rolling going up the plane when it reaches its original height. But now if we have a flat plane, it never goes up. So when will it stop? And in fact, of course, it does not stop theoretically without any friction, the ball will roll forever. This is an incredible leap of imagination. This is a wonderful insight into Galileo's genius. And uh, I sent two, um, two, two descriptions, two excerpts in, in one document. This one here is from uh, uh, the, uh, the dialogue on two chief world systems. And it's a wonderful two page dialogue where, where he is explaining to Simplicico, the uh, representative of Aristotle's thinking of the law of inertia. He brings him along with asking questions very much in the Socratic method. Uh, Galileo was a master of this method. And he finally gets uh, uh, Simplicico to agree that yes, this ball would roll forever, as you see in that highlighted, uh, my highlighted, Salviati, who, who was the representative of Galileo says, therefore, if the space, if the space were without end, that flat plane was without end, the motion upon it would likewise have no termination, that is, would be perpetual. This is a something that is beyond the paradigm of, of really the ancient and the medieval world. The medieval world was a closed world, closed with, the, with God and the heavens around it. There was no such notion of moving in an infinite kind of way. This is really a remarkable thing that, that Galileo brings um, to, to, to the thought. Uh, how does he come across this? Where, where does this come from? It's very interesting. Uh, he, he sees it um, uh, first by studying the, the pendulum. And let me show you uh, what, what I mean. He says, we all know that if you uh, swing a pendulum from one side, it'll pretty much go up to the other side. Much easier to see this than rolling a ball down uh, an inclined plane because there's a lot less friction here. And so the ball will you know, get close enough that you can really see that you really go up and reach uh, its, its height on the other side. <clears throat> he says, but, but what happens if you go ahead and put a nail in the, uh, in the, uh, in, in the way and, uh, and release um, the, uh, the pendulum again? Here the nail is here. So as the string comes across, it's gonna get stuck, right? The string will not be able to move beyond the nail there. <clears throat> so when you swing the pendulum, it still reaches the same height. And this in fact is the case. This is what, what he saw. You could even use the height that you uh, put, release the pendulum from using this height itself, putting the nail down here and releasing the pendulum. And sure enough, it again goes back to the same height. And as he sees this, he says, well, this is the way the ball would react on the, on the inclined plane. This is a much better example of that same basic phenomenon 
uh, because I have a lot less friction here. And this is in his writings where he explains where he's able to see that, that thought experiment for the inclined plane. Even if you put the nail lower down and leave a very little string left, if you release it from the same height, if the string is long enough, it will still go back and release that, uh, that up to that original height. So this is where he sees uh, uh, that phenomenon first, studies it here in detail, and then extracts it for the motion of the, uh, of, uh, of, of the pendulum. So there's a picture from the two new sciences where he's got his pendulum swinging back and forth and the nail is first here and the arc will only go up to here and then he puts the nail down here and the arc will only, but the arc always comes back up to that original height. And it's from there where he extracts the great thought experiment here, uh, leading to uh, an example demonstration of the law uh, of inertia. And the law of inertia of course turns into Newton's first law of motion. Very famous sentence, a body at rest will remain at rest and a body moving at a constant speed in a straight line will continue to do so unless it is acted upon by an unbalanced force. <clears throat> okay. uh, Newton in his writings gives Galileo complete credit for his first law of motion. And Newton does not give credit to anybody, <laughs> but he gives complete credit to Galileo. It says it explicitly in the Principia that I got this, from Galileo. <clears throat> okay, so, so much for the first part. Uh, what we need to know about moving uh, motion in a straight line. And we, of course, done a million move, motion problems in our algebra study of moving uh, things in a straight line where speed is equal to distance times time. But the physics of it is that new discovery of the law of inertia, that if you take away any impediments, something will move in a straight line forever. Here's the second uh, study, the study of free fall. Uh, picture says it all. The Aristotelians believed that a heavy, heavier object would fall faster. This, of course, is true uh, observationally, dropping a hammer and a feather here on Earth. The hammer will drop faster, but it's not because it's heavier. It's because the hammer lead, lead, uh, meets less wind resistance. If you take away the wind resistance, things will fall at the same speed. Galileo again realized this. He has a wonderful argument to show why uh, this would have to be so, uh, which I really don't have time to, to go into. But again, it is in his, his writings. But I did hope, I hope you did get a chance to watch one of the videos. I think both of them have the great clip from the moon of Armstrong dropping the hammer and the feather on the moon and them falling at the same time from his hands and uh, saying, yeah, this is, uh, this is what Galileo told us long ago. And this is part of the reason why I'm here standing here is because of his work. It's a wonderful tribute to uh, Galileo. Funny story, if you, you may know, the first time they did this, uh, the other astronaut, I forget, Armstrong and, uh, oh gosh, why couldn't, I'm sure someone remembers his name. He was ready with the camera and he had the hammer and the feather ready to take the photograph and the feather stuck to his suit with the static electricity. <laughs> they had to somewhere or other get rid of the static electricity from his arm so that the feather would, would drop. They had, to, they had to do a second take <laughs> of that uh, on the moon to, uh, to do that. So Galileo goes much, much further than just saying that heavy ob that objects will fall at the same, same way, no matter what their, what, what their uh, weight is. No, he was interested in how do things fall? And this is so important, that word, how. How do things fall? Until the time of Galileo, through the ancient Greeks, through the, through the Middle Ages, up, up through, the, uh, through, through all of that period, the important question was, why do things fall? And Aristotle had his reasons, which we don't have any time to go into, but they were all wrong. <laughs> and they lead to all kinds of wrong conclusions, like, for example, that heavy objects fall faster than, than, than uh, light objects. They, the, those conclusions come directly from his wrong reasoning of why things fall. Galileo says explicitly in his writings, let's not worry about why things fall. Matter of fact, we don't even, we're not even up to that yet. The first thing we have to answer is how do things fall? What are the mathematical laws, if there are any, that cover how things fall? Then 
If we can once discover that, maybe we have a chance in asking the question, why do things fall? Again, just another, I don't know, insight into his incredible genius. He changes the whole game of science from asking the questions of why to the questions of how, and they have never changed since. You look at any mathematical theory from Newton's theory of motion up to the, uh, to, to the, uh, the, the part particle physics of the standard model of particle physics. What all those, and everything else in between, what every uh, relativity and electromagnetism of Maxwell, you name any theory, what that theory is talking about is how things behave. Trying to describe mathematically how they behave, not why they behave that way. <clears throat> not, there's no ultimate whys in science. And Galileo was the first one to say, let's get rid of that. Let's focus on the how. And this is what he came up with. He makes an assumption that the speed will increase in proportion to the time. He, of course, has no way to measure speed, certainly no measure like this, right? There's no speedometer that you can put on that rock and watch the speedometer grow faster and faster. He has no stop motion cameras, okay? Uh, he has to make an assumption that, um, that the laws of nature are simple and, the, and the, the, the law of the increasing speed should be the simplest one possible. There was a great debate going back hundreds of years, going back even to Leon, it's in Leonardo's writings, that does the speed increase as the distance increases? Is the speed increase proportional to the growing distance or is it proportional to the growing time? And there was a great debate back and forth. Galileo shows that the distance uh, proportion would not work. It would lead to a paradox that the only reasonable one would be that the speed grows as time grows. And that is also in the second writing that I gave in, in the uh, discourse. Here in the discourse, this is that motion uh, opening paragraph. And I would like to read uh, part of this to show his reasoning of why he finally comes to his assumption that the speed will increase as the time increases, that the speed is proportional to the time, that the speed is equal to some constant times time. Those things which happen which relate to uniform motion have been considered in the preceding book. Next, accelerated motion will be treated. And first, it's appropriate to seek out and clarify the definition that best agrees with the accelerated motion which nature employs. Second paragraph, but since nature does employ a certain kind of acceleration for descending heavy things, we decided to look into their properties so that we might be sure that the definition of accelerated motion which we are about to adduce agrees with the essence of naturally accelerated motion. And at length, after continued agitation of the mind, we are confident that this has been found chiefly for the very powerful reason that the essential successive, successively demonstrated by us corresponds to and are seen to be in agreement with that which was physical experiment sets forth to the senses. I believe that the, that, the, that the speed increases with time because I've run an experiment which agrees, which is compatible with that belief. And this is the experiment that we're going to describe. This is the famous experiment of him rolling balls down the inclined plane. Both done very, very, shown very, very nicely in both uh, videos uh, that I recommended. Thus, when I consider that a stone falling from rest at some height successfully, I'm sorry, I didn't finish the last part. Further as it is, it is um, further it is as though we have been led by the hand to investigations of naturally accelerated motion <clears throat> by considerations um, of the customs of, and procedures of nature itself. For in all of her, of her works, in the performance of which she habitually employs the first, simplest, and easiest means. This is the faith of scientists. This is a faith. This is a faith as much as any other faith that nature employs the simplest and easiest means. This is what gives scientists the ability and the, the faith, the fortitude to go out and investigate nature and use the tools that we have, primarily that of mathematics, because of this faith, 
This faith, of course, has been won out over, over 3,000 years of scientific investigation. It's not something that is based upon uh, on authority. It is based upon the fact that this faith gives us um, the, the tremendous theories of, of, uh, of science and the technologies that come with it. But it is ultimately a, a faith. And Galileo here describes it here. Thus, when I consider that a stone falling from rest at some height successfully acquires new increments of speed, why should I not believe that these additions are made by the simplest and most evident rule? And what to him, the simplest and most evident rule is the fact that the speed is proportional to the time. Okay? And that's what he states, that a body dropped from rest will gain equal increments of speed in equal increments of time. That's what that last part of the paragraph that I didn't read. So he believes two things. He believes, well, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. So to state that proportion as an equation, uh, the velocity is equal to some constant times the time. Okay. That constant is called the acceleration. So if he could take data on speed, which he cannot, uh, he does not have the technology to actually measure a speed. He doesn't have some kind of a radar gun, which will read back to him speed. If he could take data, this is the kind of data he's anticipating, okay? That as time goes on, as the clock ticks, one, two, three, four, whatever the first speed is, call it A, then after the second second, the speed will be 2A. And after the third second, the speed will be 3A and so on. This is his assumption because he believes that nature follows the simplest rules. And this is the last line uh, of the quote that I didn't, of the bottom paragraph that I didn't read. So I say that motion is equally or uniformly accelerated, which when moving from rest, adds on to itself equal momenta of speed in equal times. And if you go ahead and read at your leisure, which I really encourage you to do, to read those two excerpts, to get a sense of, of Galileo's writing style, it has been said, by the way, that Galileo was one of the masters of Renaissance Italian prose. His Italian prose uh, is, uh, is, still, is still studied uh, as by, by a stylist. <clears throat> and so he comes up with the, of course, the incredible idea that dropping things in free fall is much too fast. He doesn't even have a hope of measuring distance in free fall. Another aspect of his genius. I'm sorry to keep saying this, guys. Uh, yeah, you, you can see this. Galileo is one of my heroes. Absolutely. Galileo and Archimedes are my two great heroes. <clears throat> he comes to this piece of genius that if he rolls balls down inclined planes, tries to take away as much of the friction as possible, he will simulate the same acceleration of gravity just watered down that gravity will behave in the same fundamental way, following the same fundamental law, as he states, that the velocity will increase proportional to the time. That'll happen also on his inclined planes, no matter what slope he uses. So let's use the lowest slope that I can get away with, that the ball won't get stuck, that it will run, that it will roll, you know, continuously in a smooth way, taking the hardest, smoothest ball that I can on the smoothest plane that I can that I can make, smoothing it out with the best sandpaper that I can use, et cetera, et cetera, taking away all the impediments that I can. I can study motion down the, on an inclined plane and it will follow the same fundamental law that the motion will increase in proportion to the time. This is his assumption that he can do this. There's no law that says this. He's making this up, guys, as he goes along. But so far, he has been completely right every single time. He is forging a new science here all by himself. It is, in a sense, unprecedented until we get the work of Newton, to the work of Newton, and we see it again in the work of Einstein. It's really first done in physics in the work of Galileo. So, his analysis. Well, we know that, we certainly know that when the velocity is constant, it's very easy, right? We know, <laughs> we've seen this formula a million times. 
distance is equal to speed times time. We've used it in all of those motion problems uh, of the algebra that we were doing weeks on. But it's interesting if you notice that speed times time, that, that gives us the uh, distance is equal to the area of the rectangle, the speed on the, the area under the, 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 the speed curve. <clears throat> These, the traditional letter used for, for um, speed because it's actually symbol for velocity. Speed is one component of velocity. Velocity is a vector. It has both a, a size, how fast you're going, that's the speed. And the other component is direction that it's going in. So we can use speed and, and directions uh, uh, you know, synonymously uh, because we're not concerned with direction particularly. But the letter that's used is V for velocity. So the point is if distance is equal to speed times time, well, the speed is the height and the time is the length. That's the area of the rectangle. So we have an observation that we see if we make this into a graph, that geometrically the distance that you travel under constant speed is equal to the area under the graph. Okay, very nice. Now let's go ahead and take Galileo's assumption. Let's assume that the speed is changing all the time in proportional to the time. Therefore, we would have a straight line <laughs> with a slope of V, right? That's why we've studied our analytic geometry. By the way, Galileo does not use analytic geometry. Analytic geometry was developed while he was basically under house arrest after the Inquisition threw him in, under house arrest after the publication of the Dialogue of Two, of two World Sciences in 1932. This is when Descartes and Fermat are beginning to develop this mathematics. He is now a man of 75 plus uh, under house arrest. And no, he is not about to learn new mathematics at this point in his career. He develops all of these uh, results using Euclidean geometry. Works very, very well. Newton 50, 75 years later also wrote the Principia <laughs> in Euclidean geometry. He, did, he, he worked out many of his results using his calculus, but when he wanted to present them, he presented them using Euclidean geometry because nobody knew the calculus at the time. So Galileo is using Euclidean geometry. We are in an anachronism going to use the math that we have, that we developed that was just beyond him historically. So assuming uh, Galileo's law that the velocity increases uh, proportion to the time that the velocity formula is V is equal to AT, <clears throat> Galileo says, well, let's look at that area again. <clears throat> so he makes two assumptions, assumptions. Number one, we've already read. He assumes that the velocity is equal to the acceleration times the time, proportional to the time. This is, we're talking now about free fall, okay? I should, probably should have said that. He's analyzing when you drop something uh, in a gravitational field. He assumes that, as we've, as we've talked about, as we saw in his writings there, and he does assume that the distance gone does equal to the, the area under the speed curve, just as in the case of a constant velocity. Well, given those two assumptions, we can go ahead and find the area. The area is the area of the triangle. We know the area of the triangle. It's one half the height times the base. It's one half of the height times the base. <clears throat> the area is equal to one half the height, AT, times the base, T, <laughs> over two. It's one half the height times the base. So the formula is his famous acceleration, distance formula for acceleration, one half AT squared. A very, very famous formula, okay? That's using these two assumptions. <clears throat> now, the first assumption, he, he cannot prove directly, but he does have a proof for the second one. And uh, so there's our distance uh, being represented by the area under the speed curve. <clears throat> he, he proves this. He proves that this distance traveled during the constant acceleration over time t, moving from rest to a velocity of v, will equal the distance equal to the average speed times the time. If you take the average of all the speeds, and if it's speeding up continuously, that would be the middle speed, the speed in the middle. If you see how far you would go if you were traveling at that constant middle speed, you would be you would wind up with the same distance as if you know with the acceleration going faster and faster. Okay, this is something that was you know understood to be true. This made sense to everyone um, <clears throat> that the you would go in this increasing speed uh, the same distance that if you simply traveled all the time at the average speed. 
And there's that average speed, that middle speed. And if you look at how far you would go under the average speed, it will be the area under that curve. But we're back to a rectangle, okay? And indeed, that rectangle does have the same area as our VT, uh, AT rectangle. <clears throat> Why? Because these two triangles are congruent, right? They're both right triangles. <clears throat> They've got, you know, right angles. They've got vertical angles. These two sides are, you know, we have angle side angle. These two triangles are congruent. And therefore, the area of the rectangle is equal to the area of the triangle. Okay. <clears throat> and so if we assume, given that we know geometrically that the areas are the same and therefore geometrically that this equation here, the area of the rectangle is equal to the area of the triangle. And we're assuming that the area of the rectangle does equal how far you would go under acceleration. Galileo was able to say then the area that the how far you would go under the acceleration is my geometric value, okay? So he does have a proof that the distance is proportional to the time squared. It's a bit of a bit of a of a, of a you know, process here um, of deducing from uh, his mathematical law of at using this argument here of air, areas under 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 speed curves uh, that the that under this acceleration the distance would be proportional to the time squared. In fact, particularly one half at squared, where a is that constant proportionality that the V is growing at. With this general law, he's able to state the law of free fall. Galileo's famous law of free fall that in fact, the distance of a falling body is equal to one half GT squared. It increases <clears throat> uh, where G is the traditional letter used for the acceleration of gravity. <clears throat> In feet per second, it's 32 feet per second faster every second, right? And in, in metric students, it's 9.8 meters per second faster every second. We're gonna use feet. It's a nice round number, nice nice number to use for, it's all we need for our demonstrations. We don't need the metric system for what we're doing. And so we come to his empirical proof that distance does uh, grow with the time squared. And this is where we come to the odd numbers rule. In the first unit of time, the ball will roll down one unit of distance, whatever that distance is. You go ahead and measure uh, how far the ball rolls down in one unit of your time, whatever your time you wanna pick. See how far it moves down. Then in the next unit of time, it'll move three times that distance. And in the next unit, your unit of time, it'll move five and then seven. Okay. So here, take, take a unit of time. In our simple case, let's take a second. He did not have seconds in that sense, but uh, so it'll roll down some distance that I'm calling B. Okay? What Galileo was able to show empirically that in the next unit of time, it moved down 3B. And in the next unit of time, 5B, and then 7B, and 9B. B being that first distance that it moved in the first unit of time. And clearly the ratio of these increasing distances is to the odd numbers. Right? It's not hard to add up these numbers to get the sum of how far you've traveled in total as the time ticks on. And notice that when you add up the odd numbers, you get the square numbers. Yeah, we saw that in, in, in uh, lecture one, didn't we? <laughs> I pointed that out. This is usually a method to my madness when I do these things. And it just took nine and just took seven classes for me to come around to why. So yes, we can clearly see that the distance is equal to b times t squared, right? So you go after the second second, you're at 4b, then you add 5 to 4b, you get 9b, that's 3 squared, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, his odd numbers rule does lead him to able to deduce very simply that the distance is equal to, uh, the distance increasing is equal to the time squared. Therefore, and this is, so he shows by experiment this. Uh, if, he, if he had data, this is what the data would look like on his inclined plane, showing ultimately that the distance is equal to the time square. Therefore, guys, what he deduces is because if the velocity increases with time, I get this, 
if the velocity increases with time, then I've proven mathematically that the distance must increase with time squared. I have now showed by experiment that the distance increases with time squared. Therefore, I conclude that it must have been that the velocity increases with time. That is, according to formal logic, bad logic. That is invalid reasoning. If A implies B and you show that B is true, you cannot imply that A is true. There may be other reasons why B is true. This is what Galileo is doing. This is another thing which he is doing for the first time, essentially. He's saying because of the mathematical relationships here, yes, it is theoretically possible that there could be for some other reason other than the, my mathematical demonstration that if the velocity increases with time, I demonstrate that the distance increases with time squared. Yes, there could be some other mechanism going on, but come on, okay? If you see that my, my assumption here leads to mathematically this result, and I can demonstrate this result, I've got a very, very good case. I don't have a, a lock strong mathematical case, not a logical case, but I have a scientific case that this is true. And this has been used ever since. Why do we believe the Higgs boson exists? Why was the Higgs boson discovered in 1912? in 2012, because we finally got a microscope out and someone said, there it is, there's that Higgs boson there. No, of course not. Elaborate experiments were designed, designed for years, spending millions and millions of dollars. What did it show? It showed some consequence of the Higgs boson living in the theory of the standard model. That if there was a Higgs boson that had this relationship to the rest of the standard model, this other phenomenon would be observable. That's what was observed. That's why we believe there's a Higgs boson. This is from Galileo. I'm gonna keep doing this all day, guys. I'm gonna keep showing you the genius, the, the initiation of ideas coming from this one man. This is why Galileo is Galileo. I wanna show you just a piece of his mathematics, something very pretty. He's able to prove with this acceleration going down at these different uh, values, depending upon how much of a slope he uses. He has, suppose if you dropped you know, a set of balls down a different a set of inclined planes, would you see anything interesting? He says, yeah. And he proves this mathematically, again, using Euclidean geometry. Uh, if you roll these balls, if you, if you let them all go down simultaneously down different planes, they would move with different accelerations. The middle one is free fall. He's just simply dropping that green ball down in free fall. The other ones are going down his different slopes. They would continue to hold the locus of them as they moved out would be a, a beautiful circle there with an increasing uh, diameter and the center, you know, dropping down. So a very nice theorem. We can't prove this theorem, unfortunately, guys, because we need uh, some trig functions, which we did not get a chance to review. We'll do it in the spring, I promise. Okay. So we now have the fact that he, will, he has proven to himself and to the scientific world that yes, the acceleration is a proportional, I'm sorry, the velocity is proportional to the time equal to one half at square. So just for fun, we'll, let's, let's use his laws. Leaning Tower of Pisa, his famous story of where he did this. Uh, turns out it's 180 feet high. I asked you a question, how long does it take for a stone to drop uh, from the top of the Tower of Pisa to hit the ground? Well, we've got our two laws, right? We've got the, uh, we've got the velocity as a function of time is equal to gt, 32t. And the height at any time is h minus the amount that you fall. The height, 180, minus the falling that you're doing as time goes on. So it's h minus 1 half gt squared, which is 180 minus 16t squared. I think that's enough for us to answer our questions. We can go ahead and graph these two functions. They have two very nice graphs. Okay. Mark the graphs. Uh, the blue is our, is our height uh, function. 
and we recognize the straight line as the velocity function of gt. Um, so the height, well, we know the height at any time. You want to know uh, uh, when it fell, when it hit the ground? Well, find out what t gives you zero, right? Uh, what is the gt uh, that gives you a height of zero? That's when it fell. Not hard to solve for t. t is equal to the square root of 180 over 16, which is 3.35 seconds, okay? So there's where it hits the ground. Okay, and how fast is it going? Well, we have a we have a, a speed formula. Just take the functional value of that time. Functional value of three point three five is a hundred and seven some odd feet per second. Okay, so using uh, using Galileo's laws. Okay, you'll notice an interesting thing about this graph. They cross. It's very interesting. They cross on the same on the same axis because this axis here is feet and this axis here is feet per second. But it turns out, given 180, that the speed stays in the same range of values as, uh, as the distance. Just a coincidence, <clears throat> if you drop something from much, much higher or much, much lower, then the speeds and the distances would not line up so, so well. But here they do uh, very nicely. And uh, I ask you a question. Wouldn't it be interesting to know just where, what time it is that the height of the ball is exactly equal to the speed? of the ball. Wouldn't that be a fun thing to know? Yeah, just when, when is that? And in fact, what is that common speed and time? So I asked you to tackle that for fun. I got some nerve giving you homework in the last day of class. I know, I know, all right. <clears throat> and speaking of homework, uh, another, uh, another blue question. Here's a classic question. You drop a stone down a well. Six and a half seconds later, you hear a splash. How far down is the water level? Okay. Let's take the speed of sound. I fudged the numbers a little bit so that so our numbers will come out a bit easier than the real numbers. I'm trying to get rid of decimal points here. Uh, take the speed of sound to be 1,152 feet. And that's so bad. It's speed of sound is usually taken as 1,100. I threw in the 52 just to give us a bit of an easy number. So shoot me. Turns out that the answer is 576 feet. So I ask you to go ahead and, and give that a try. And I had a little bit of fun animating that for you. Showing off my animations today. Here we have the ball going down the well. And it drops in free fall, right? Going faster and faster. You're looking at the time there in black. As the time goes, it finally hits and the splash and the sound, you know, bounces up. Okay. So you can see that as we fall, it's falling in larger and larger increments of time, time squared. And finally here at six is when it will uh, hit the ground. That's what you'll find when you do the algebra. It will reach uh, the value uh, on the speed of the acceleration side will be six and it'll come back in half a second. That was my fudge so that the numbers wouldn't be so bad. So the answer is 576 and I, uh, Ask you guys to have some fun with it. And of course, as always, answers to all these are at the back of the uh, presentation. Okay. So uh, we are, are ready for the last, uh, last piece. Uh, we've done law of inertia. We've done the law of free fall. And now we're about to finish the analysis of, uh, of the projectile. <clears throat> Before I do that, let me open up, uh, Jenny, are there any questions in chat or would anybody like to ask a question or what we've done so far? None in chat, but- I would like to ask a question. Okay, you'll have, I'll give another chance later. I think we're, we're moving along pretty well. I'm glad we maybe have some little bit of time here. <clears throat> Where will it land problem? <clears throat> Okay, this is another question that Galileo answered for the first time. <clears throat> it was thought for 2000 years that if you had a moving ship and you had a ball drop from the moving mast of the ship, uh, <clears throat> as the ship continues to move through the water, the ball would drop down and would fall you know, away from the mast of the ship. Okay, that the ball would drop straight down. Aristotle's reasoning is falling to the center of the earth the center of the earth is not moving, only the ship is moving, blah, blah, blah. 
everything is wrong. Okay, Galileo says no. Matter of fact, in the uh, in in the in, in the dialogue of two chief world systems, he uh, he asks Simplicio about this very question, and Simplicio gives this answer. And he says, Simplicio, why why do you say this? Did you do this? He says, Well, no, I read it in a book. <laughs> Galileo says, Yeah, and uh, you know what? You know what I think? You know the people who wrote the book, they didn't do it either. They probably read it in another book. <laughs> it turns out if you do it, if you do the experiment, what you'll find is this. You'll find that the ball stays up with the ship, that the ball will fall down at the foot of the mast. <clears throat> and why is this? Why is this happening? Okay. Galileo doesn't, he doesn't explain complete to Simplicio like this. Simplicio wouldn't be able to absorb all this at one time. He says, as you drop the ball, the ball is moving with you, right? You're holding the ball in the, up in the cockpit, whatever that thing is up there, the crow's nest, okay? The ball is moving with the ship. It has a speed. When you let it go, that speed doesn't go away because of the law of inertia. It continues to move with the speed of the ship forward. It only now begins to acquire a second motion straight down in the law of free fall. The, the, the rock, the ball is moving in two different ways simultaneously and independently. It's moving vertically because of the law of inertia and it's moving straight down because of the law of free fall and they are, they are moving independent of each other. You can analyze this motion in its two separate components. I know what you're gonna, yeah, this is another discovery of Galileo, another contribution to the law of motion. A picture's worth a thousand words. Let me show you what I mean. Here we have a ship, here's the crow's nest, here's the ball we're going to drop. <clears throat> Let's say that as the ship goes by, it goes underneath a bridge <laughs> and there's someone standing here with a stone that just as the ball with the crow's nest goes under, he's gonna drop the, um, the the uh, stone from the fr from the stationary bridge, and the ball will be dropped from the crow's nest. So what happens? Let's run the uh, animation first. Galileo says that's what's going to happen. Okay. So as the ball moves along <clears throat> at a constant speed, increment increment distance of distance with time, because it's a constant speed, this will not change, okay? The ball will continue to move that way. The ball continues to stay under the orange ball, which is a simulation of exactly what would happen if the ball was not dropped. It will continue to move with the speed of the ship. It'll continue to have this position uh, in terms of the uh, horizontal position. But as it drops, it drops exactly the same way the ball that's dropping in pure free fall. It continues to have the same height as it goes down. These two motions are happening simultaneously and independently. And therefore, when, if we wanted to analyze mathematically this motion, we get a break. We can analyze the horizontal motion and we can analyze the vertical motion independently. We can isolate those two mathematical analyses. And then with a little bit of luck, we can put them together with the full trajectory. Yeah, that's, that's what we're gonna do guys. That's exactly what we're about. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And we're gonna come up with a projectile motion. Some pretty pictures of projectiles. Okay. It is a beautiful uh, arc. It is a beautiful curve. Uh, Leonardo did extensive studies on the projectile. Uh, he was, uh, you know, part of his job was to build weapons and things. He never got a chance to do that. Uh, his patrons were small enough to, to keep him as, a, as an artist and, and uh, an architect as opposed to building weapons. But he, he made these studies in hopes that he could build weapons. Uh, and so we see parabolas um, all the time, everywhere. These are all parabolas, these are all projectiles, of course. And this is the general equation of the projectile. <clears throat> this is if you start from the ground and shoot up, 
This is the full projectile of all those pictures that I showed you. You can see why we can't do this analysis this term. We didn't get a chance to do the cosine and then the sine and the tan functions. We didn't get a chance to review our, our trig functions, okay? And I say review, okay? I know all you guys have seen the trig functions before, but I didn't want to throw this at you here in the last day without reviewing them. So what we're going to analyze is the, you know, the, uh, the ball being thrown out from the mass of the ship, you know, or being dropped from the mass of the ship or thrown out from the, uh, from, from the cliff. <clears throat> We're going to analyze this motion here. We're gonna go through Galileo's analysis. Just as I described, we're gonna analyze the vertical motion. We're gonna analyze the horizontal motion separately. And then we'll see if we have the algebraic uh, chops to put them together. And you will be surprised to know that you exactly do. You have exactly the stuff that we've been doing all these weeks um, to do this. So we have a ball at this top of this cliff H and we're gonna throw it out with a speed V. What is its trajectory? Well, we're gonna take an arbitrary position T, time. Where is it here? What is its X coordinate? How far away from the base of the cliff is it? What is its Y coordinate? How high is it above the ground? Can we find these two numbers as functions of time independently? Yes, we can. Okay. <clears throat> and the range, of course, is how far the ball moves out from the base of the cliff when it finally hits the ground. Well, we know it falls at GT squared, right? That's Galileo's law of free fall. That's how long it falls in the time T, Galileo's law of free fall. Therefore, the height of the ball y is h minus one half gt squared. Right? It started at h and it's getting less and less by one half gt squared. So we, we, we record that. We now know what y is as a function of t, the law of free fall. But this ball is moving out at a constant speed. There's no, we've taken away air resistance here. We're doing this on the moon. Uh, and so the speed remains constant in the x direction. It's very, very simple. The distance out x is simply v t. The v does not change. And so the x value is v t. And as mathematicians hate, and as physicists love to say, the rest is just math. We have analyzed the two uh, components of the motion using our laws that Galileo discovered, and the law of free fall and the law of inertia. And now we can put these together. We can use our substitution. We have two equations and two unknowns, guys. What we're going to do is we're going to eliminate t. We'll take the x equation, we'll solve for t, x is equal to x over v, and take the y equation and stick in x over v wherever we see t. Okay. Uh, we'll put it into the t squared expression there, becomes x over v squared, and y is equal to h minus gx squared over 2v squared. Putting all that, putting the x squared outside, we have h minus g over 2v squared x squared. We recognize that as our parabola. This is the parabola that, we've been, that we studied uh, all of last week. It's in the form c minus ax squared, where c in this case is, is h. Okay? And the a is g over v squared. We know all about this. We know the p, we know the focus, we know the um, um, directrix, we know all about this. But we're interested in the physics right now, not, not, not the geometry. So I ask a, a question, just, just as an example, what is the range of this projectile given this mathematical analysis? Well, we have an equation uh, for y, right? Y is here, y is equal to h minus g over two v squared x squared. Aren't you asking me the question when y is zero? That's the range. Tell me x when y is zero. But I can do a bit more, guys. I can do a bit more here because I have y as a function of time. I can tell you when the ball hits the ground, okay? By using this equation for y in terms of t, I can say when is y zero? Not what x is when y is zero, but first, when is y zero? I can set my function of, y, of t equal to zero and find what t gives me a y of zero. It turns out it's easy equation to solve. It's the square root of two h over g. Isn't that the flight time? Isn't that the time the ball is in the air? 
our analysis here of doing the two uh, X and Y separately, evaluating the motion, expressing the motion in terms of its coordinates. This is called, by the way, parametric equations of the trajectory, fancy word. We'll get to that in the spring as well. This is just the first example of it. But we have these parametric equations, both X and Y, both in terms of T, we can use them uh, to further our analysis. And if you look at that equation, doesn't it make sense? What is the flight time? Isn't the flight time proportional to H? Doesn't H belong in the numerator? The higher the, the, uh, the, the cliff, the longer it'll be in the air. And doesn't G belong in a denominator? The faster the acceleration of gravity, the shorter it'll be in the air. Yeah, we can't predict the two, we can't predict the square root sign. The math has got to tell us that. The math is much smarter than we are to give the exact answer, but it makes sense to us that the T is in the numerator and the G is in the denominator. And now that I know what the flight time is, well, I don't need to even to solve this equation up here. I can go ahead and solve the X equation. Uh, the value of X at any time is V times that T. So just use the flight time T. So how far did you go? You went V times the flight time. Okay, which is exactly the same solution you get if you solve this equation for x. You get v times the square root of the flight time. Okay. So this is a beautiful piece of work. This is something to really look at, guys, to understand uh, what, what Galileo has done here. This is his new ways and means. This is unprecedented in the history of science. Galileo is doing here is he's taking a natural motion, a natural projection in the real world that he sees and he analyzes it mathematically using the laws of motion. Happens to be the laws that he also discovered, but we won't, we won't say that again. This has never been done before. We say, wait a minute, didn't, didn't, didn't uh, you know, Copernicus have the trajectories, you know, the circles uh, going, of the earth going around the sun? Didn't the Greeks have the, uh, you know, the, the planets going around the earth? No, this, that's not this. Those are just theoretical models. You saw, you know, points in the sky and you, 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 drew, you, drew three, you drew geometric models and showed that, you know, you could write down some, uh, some, some geometry that could, uh, that could make those observations true. Galileo is doing something new here. He's taking something real in the real world not little points up in space, okay, on this dome. He's seeing what, what Leonardo was interested in. When you, when you shoot a cannon out, how far will it go? How high will it go? What's its position at any time? How high do I have to, to, uh, to uh, pitch the cannon? What kind of a muzzle velocity do I need for it to get over this wall? All these questions are answerable by this analysis. This is way beyond the simple geometric models of Copernicus and Ptolemy. We're in a totally different world here. We're in a new world. And this world is introduced to us by Galileo. I don't wanna leave this slide if there is a question about it. Can I answer a question about any of this analysis here? This is not, this is a lot of ideas here. A question. Okay, the ways and means. If this is not the most famous quote uh, in all of science, it's in the top three from Galileo. Philosophy is written in this grand book, I mean the universe, which stands continually open to our eyes, but it cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language and interpret the characters in which it is written. It's written in the language of mathematics and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures. We would now use equations and functions <laughs> without which it is humanly impossible to understand a single word of it. Without these, one is wandering around in a dark labyrinth. I'm sure most of you have seen this quote before. It deserves to be. This is the new ways and means he was talking about in that first paragraph. This is what he has opened up this language of mathematics to study the universe on a very different level that the Greeks ever contemplated. <clears throat> the person who would appreciate this the most would be Archimedes. He would be blown away by, by what Galileo has done here. 
And it is not surprising the famous quote uh, from Einstein that Galileo <clears throat> is the father of modern physics, no indeed of modern science itself. Okay, we're gonna end with the, the, uh, the uh, um, definition of the derivative, beginning our calculus. It's very interesting because what the derivative is gonna do for us guys, it's going to reverse Galileo's discovery. From the distance law, we will now prove the speed law. From the fact that the distance is proportional to the time squared, we will prove mathematically using the calculus, using the ideas of the calculus, this is one step beyond the algebra. The algebra can't do it for us. We need a new idea here to get there. But we're going to go from the distance is equal to b times t squared to the speed is equal to something proportional to just t. It won't be bt, it'll be a little bit different. Okay? I'm going to use for the distance as we go down the, the inclined plane s, not d. You'll see. You can't use D for distance in, uh, in, in, in physics and mathematics. You'll see what D is reserved for. Guys, remember your calculus. You can't, <laughs> you can't use D for anything else but the derivative. It would be simply just against the laws of the universe. Okay, so we're gonna use the traditional letter for distance that is used in that case is S. S is a very traditional letter that is used for position. Uh, uh, at all costs, you stay away from D. This is, by the way, is the reason why physicists stay away from F for frequency, and they use those Greek letters because F is reserved for function, and these just these just you know override uh, any use that you can make of them yourself. So Galileo has this distance law, and remember he concluded because the distance law showed that by experiment, you know, that he was able to show the distance law because the velocity flow flaw in implied the distance law, he's going to work backwards and say, you see, so the velocity law must be so. We're going to actually now derive the velocity law mathematically from the distance. So let's take an example of our law bt squared. Let's take uh, one third of t squared. Let's let b be one third. Um, I'm not being perverse by using a fraction. I need a wide parabola. I like to have a parabola that has, you know, goes out, you know, kind of slowly. I don't want a parabola that rises too quickly because of the visual that I want to show you. So I'm not being perverse here by using an a of one third, uh, our a in the uh, in the parabola of mathematics, but here in b uh, of one third. It gives me a wide parabola. Okay. I'm going to take a particular point on the parabola. Okay, uh, where uh, t is one, and therefore, if you calculate, it's uh, one third. Mm -hmm. right, one third times one square. Okay. I'm going to try to find the speed right there when the time is one. Now, the speed is increasing all the time. Okay. You, there's even a philosophical question Does it have the speed exactly at one? When I can take average speeds, I can tell you the speed between one and two, but what this speed, what has to have the speed at one? Okay. Uh, again, in that video, the one, of the one of the videos that I asked you to watch. Uh, the, the, the idea of dropping the ball when it hit, you know, the, uh, the platform down below, uh, when it was dropped high enough, it broke the, the, uh, the, the platform. Because just at that speed, at the speed at the incident, it was going fast enough to break the platform. So yes, one can say that it has a speed at every instant of time, at every T, but what is it? So we're going to take one, one, one third and use it as an example. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the average speed. Let's take a look at what we're looking at here. Here's my graph okay, that I have. <clears throat> Here's my point one one third, and I'm going to take points up above. Okay, higher t's. This I'm going to start with a t of three, and I'm going to find the average speed, the average change in distance over the change in time. I'm going to find it for a change of two. I've got the change in T in red. I've got the change in, in, in the position S in black. So here's my position, my change in P. Here's my change in T. And the third number is the, is the average of the, the um, one number over the other, the slope of the, of the, of the, of the blue line. Okay? <clears throat> it's simply the change in Y over the change in X. So the average speed turns out to be the slope of the secant line <clears throat> drawn from the two points. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that point closer and closer and closer to my one one third. And watch, see, watch how my change in time is going down by tenths. And there's one, okay. Um, and going down to 0 0.9, 0 0.8, getting closer and closer away. <clears throat> as the change in uh, T changes, the change in P changes, and so therefore the fraction, the average speed is changing. And I can go down, you know, the lowest one I can go here is 0.1. And the, the best average speed I get is 0.7. I can go slower, but closer, but this animation, you know, doesn't do that. What happens if I go all the way down to the point? Well, the algebra is gonna fail us, right? we're gonna get indeterminate, we're gonna get zero over zero. Yeah, you can't have uh, a change of, of T of zero. The algebra doesn't give us anything, okay? Or we do have a slope. There is a slope at that point to that curve. And we see why it is so important to find slopes to curves when we study motion. It literally represents the speed at that point. But how do we find it? How do we find that slope? This directly putting the algebra in will not work. You've got to do something else. We've got to look at this pattern. We got to look at this changing pattern and see if we can find a pattern that will work. We need a new algorithm as we make the, as the, the denominators get smaller and smaller. We need a new idea. By the way, uh, I can, you know, show you a little bit more. Uh, I'm sorry, if we go down to that point one, the best I could do here, there we are. Point one, we have a slope of uh, 0.7. I did go ahead and uh, go from that point one, point 0.7, and I did go down further, all the way down to point 0.01. So I just did it computationally, and we got down to point 0.67. Okay. I think you can probably guess that where we're going to is point 0.666. We're going to a slope of two thirds. Okay. So let's go back and show that to be the case. I've got five minutes. <laughs> Let me see if I can show that is the case. Okay, so here's our point. <clears throat> We're gonna go ahead and take our point 1.3. We're gonna try to find the average speed. The average speed is the change in position over the change in time. That's our formula. Let's put it in, okay? Let's take T, some arbitrary T bigger than a uh, one. And we have the change in position. Well, it's f of t minus the one third over t minus one. I can put in the value of f of t, t, t squared over three. Okay, okay. And um, I can go ahead and do some algebra. Notice that I've got t squared minus one uh, over three over t minus one. And uh, I can bring this t minus one up underneath the three. And look, I've got a T minus one on top and bottom. They will cancel out. And this is my average speed. My average speed for some T bigger than a one, my average speed is T plus one over three. Okay, very nice. What happens is I make T smaller and I'm sorry, what happens is I make T closer and closer to one. We saw what happens. We saw in the, in, in, in the animation, what happens. It's getting closer and closer, it seems to two thirds. Well, let's ask that question. What happens to t plus one over three as t goes to t zero? Well, t zero in this case is one. What happens to this expression as t gets closer and closer to one, right? Yeah, it gets closer and closer to two over three. It gets closer and closer to two thirds, which is what the arithmetic showed us, okay? So no surprise here that we're able to use this device, at least in this case, to ask that question about the closer and closer. This is the new idea beyond, beyond the algebra. You can never put t equal to t zero. If you make t equal to t zero, you're simply gonna get zero in the denominator. The algebra will fail us. But if we ask about the pattern of what happens as t gets closer and closer to t zero, we do see a pattern. We see an, an arithmetic pattern, which will never give us the exact answer, but the algebra, the algebra will show us the pattern, okay? And will show us the uh, two thirds. Let's do it one more time. Instead of uh, worrying, uh, I'm sorry. And so therefore we get a, a V, which is the slope of two thirds. Okay, let's do it one more time. Our favorite trick, let's do it in pure algebra. Let's, let's throw away one comma one three and use T zero S zero. 
okay? Which of course is T0, F of T0. That's what S0 is after all. And <clears throat> F of T0 is T0 squared over three after all. So this is T0, S0, written in pure algebra. And a trick, instead of using T being a little, something bigger than T0, instead of T, let T, let's use T0 plus H, where H is some small number. So this is T0 plus a little bit more. This is a perfectly good T. I'm just writing it as T0 plus a little bit more. I can use my algebra more effectively by keeping T0 in the T part as well. Well, for T0 plus a little bit more, that corresponding point is F of T0 plus a little bit more. And I can certainly calculate that out. And uh, T0 plus H squared over three. Well, I'm ready to go through all this algebra again. Okay, guys, I'm ready to go ahead and calculate this, this slope, the change in position over the change in time. Notice the first thing that nice happens is the denominator becomes H. That's the first advantage of using this a little bit more idea. I just get H in the denominator here. If you follow the algebra, okay, it's very simple. The math gods are with us. The T0 squares cancel out. The algebra here is very straightforward. I want to rush because I want to get to the, you know, the bottom line here, the payoff. And I get an average, an average speed. There's my average speed in terms of any arbitrary point you like, T0, plus this uh, uh, average speed uh, using the point T0 plus a little bit more. There's the algebraic value. I asked the question, what's going to happen to that average speed as H gets smaller and smaller, as T becomes closer and closer to T? Okay. <clears throat> so what happens to the average speed, the delta S over delta T, as delta T gets smaller and smaller, notice as delta T gets smaller and smaller, H gets smaller. And smaller. That's why I did this H, okay? I crafted it that way. As the change in time gets smaller and smaller, it means a little bit more is getting smaller and smaller. Well, it's easy enough to see what happens to this algebraic expression as H goes to zero. As H goes to zero, this will simply become two T zero over three that are known as two thirds of T zero. Okay? This new expression of looking at the average slope, when we make the denominator closer and closer to zero, we change it from delta S over delta T to ds dt. This is the universal nomenclature uh, of, uh, of the calculus invented by Leibniz uh, and it has never been changed since. It is a incredibly powerful uh, notation, okay? And so, we can go ahead and take any number we like, like five halves. We know that now the slope is just two thirds of five halves. <clears throat> and so the speed there at the point five halves, 25 twelfths is five thirds, two thirds of five halves. And notice that Galileo was right all the time that given this speed law, that the velocity is in fact proportional to the time. It's in this case, two thirds the time, okay? So um, yeah, Galileo was right. And uh, this thing, this new thing that we found here, this new thing that we found uh, is called the derivative of, the, uh, of this particular function, one third of t squared. We're gonna take this idea uh, of these uh, average uh, changes and looking at their, at their patterns as we, make the denominators smaller and smaller and develop a set of algorithms about them. First of all, make sense of them, a set of algorithms around them, and we begin to develop what's called the a differential calculus. Um, okay, I have, uh, if I have one minute, let me just uh, give you one, um, <clears throat> advertisement for, course in the, in the spring, what we can do to study things. Here's our parabola and just take a look at the animation for a minute. Very pretty animation. What's going on? I take any point on my parabola and I draw the tangent line. The tangent line will hit the axis of the parabola at a certain point. The theorem is that the distance from the focus, by the focus and directrix, the distance from the focus to that point that the tangent line 
creates is the same distance as the distance from the focus to my point itself. This is a theorem that we'll be able to prove about dot parabolas. Okay, very nice theorem. But this is a parabola after all, no? Therefore, if this point is on the parabola, the distance from the focus to the point on the parabola is equal to the distance from the point to the directrix. That's the definition of a parabola. So the two black lines are also of the same length. The, so therefore the red line and this black line are all, okay? They're all equal to each other. Now Euclid tells us that this must be a parallelogram because these two lines are not only equal, but of course they're parallel. So this figure now is a parallelogram, but these three sides are all equal. Therefore, this is a rhombus, okay? So very pretty. And this tangent line creates this point on the axis, which in turn creates a beautiful uh, rhombus uh, figure using the point on the, uh, on the, on the, on the uh, directrix and the focus. How pretty can you get? There are many, many more uh, that I could show you. And by the way, it doesn't make any difference uh, where I put the C, it makes no difference. The relationship continues to hold, et cetera. Okay, so that is it guys, that's what I have for you. And uh, let me get out of this. All right, we are done. Um, any, any last questions before we go? I hope I haven't stunned you by putting too much into one lecture. I may have, but I tried to, you know, get what I was trying to do all term in this thing. I apologize if it was overwhelming. Any comments at all? There are comments. Maybe people just want to unmute and- Yeah, please, please unmute. And uh, if you can stay around, by the way, before I, I comments, I did send the, um, the uh, description of what I plan to be teaching in the spring, the description of the calculus, where we'll be doing the full <laughs> parabola and all its pretty uh, uh, functions and uh, uh, projectiles and orbits, uh, um, ellipse orbits or planets, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll take a look at that, at that right up. Okay, comments. Nothing other than I was deriving the formula for the volume of a sphere in my head the other night in some dream. I'm impressed that you did it in, in your head. <laughs> that is not I, easy. I, not that you've been but now I'm dreaming about deriving calculus oh. formula. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I, I've, I, I, I've made an impact. I, I don't know if it's good or bad. Any other comments? All right, guys. Well, thank you for staying with me. I've enjoyed uh, teaching this course. It was so weird being remote, particularly a course like this, where in person would have been so much more effective, doing so much detailed math, asking you guys to participate. We could have done some problems together in class. It's really a shame. I hope that you, some of you can join me in the spring and we can be back in person and really have a whole lot more fun uh, uh, being mathematicians. So thank you again, guys, and you know, hopefully see you in the spring. Susie, I put a question in the chat. Please, what is it? Uh, well, it's it's probably easier if you read it from the chat. No, go ahead, say. It. <laughs> okay. Um, my point is that it it's kind of an historical question. Uh, catapults were used in by the fourth century BC yes. by the Greeks. And yes. by the Chinese. Yes. So how yes. did they how did they aim them? All trial and error. <laughs> you reckon? Okay. All lots lots of trials. So the so 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 the so so the people knew they they knew their catapults. Trial yeah. and error. You know, the only thing I can I can think is that my brother in law who did uh, uh, trained as a carpenter in England. Uh, was able to uh, he he never had to measure things you know if he he would say oh i need a board that long and he would just cut it and he never used a tape experience so is an I, amazing experience is an amazing teacher for sure yeah okay all right guys i'm gonna i'm gonna let you go i'm gonna i'm gonna turn off the recording for one thing <laughs>